Hey, what's up, guys? Thank you so much for joining us as we walk through everything that you need to know to beat daily fantasy basketball in 2020. My name is Andy Baldacci. I'm the CEO of Sabersim, and I'm joined by DFS Pros, Sabersim Partners, and twin brothers, Max and Danny Steinberg. How's it going, guys? Very it's going well, great. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is going to be a good one. And what we're going to go over today is we're going to cover the fundamentals of daily fantasy basketball. And then Danny's going to break down the secrets of winning lineups, what it takes to have your lineup stand apart from the rest of the field so you can win some of these big tournaments. And then Max is going to show you how to put it all together by walking through his build process step by step. The first thing we want to go over are just these fundamentals. And honestly, we'll keep it pretty simple. Um, you guys know how basketball works, I hope. If not, there's always Wikipedia you can check out, but again, hopefully you know the basics there. And when it comes down to it, between the main sites, DraftKings and FanDuel, there aren't too many major differences. The first thing to just know is that on FanDuel, blocks and steals are worth more and turnovers have more of a penalty to them. Whereas DraftKings has obviously a smaller penalty for turnovers and slightly more points for rebounds and three-pointers. But the big thing on DraftKings is that they have triple-double and double-double bonuses. Uh, the other thing to point out is that DraftKings theoretically allows for up to seven players from the same team in your lineups. The only lineup requirement is that you need to have players from two games, whereas FanDuel has a maximum limit of four players per team. In baseball and hockey and in practically every other sport, these differences um, around what makes a valid lineup are pretty important because stacking is just such a huge variable in what goes into um, winning lineups. In NBA, stacking is something to think about. There are correlations, and Danny is going to dig into that in a little bit, but it's nowhere near as important. So honestly, you don't need to worry too much about the limitations on the lineups. And when it comes to the difference in scoring, if you're making your own projections, obviously you want to be aware of that. But with basketball, um, there are a lot of good sources out there for projections. We're very proud of our own NBA projections. And if you're using a projection source, this all should be baked in there. So really for these kind of fundamental parts of the game, there's not too much that you need to pay attention to, which does make it different than a lot of the other sports out there. Um, the other thing to add is just, yeah, usually Wednesdays and Fridays have tended to be the biggest days, but in this weird season, I, we're honestly not too sure what that will look like. So we'll just kind of be keeping an eye on things as the schedule progresses, as DraftKings and FanDuel and the other sites kind of get into their own rhythm. But with that out of the way, what we should do now is just jump into really the meat of this, and that is how to build winning lineups. What is the secret to doing this? And Danny? Do you want to take over here? Yeah. Um, so there are three key elements to building winning lineups and having upside. Um, those are correlations, ownerships, and variance. So correlations are the measurement of how each player's performance impacts other players in the same game. And this is kind of where the value of stacking comes from. So in many sports like League of Legends and, and MLB, um, there's a strong correlate, a positive correlation between players on the same team. So you can take advantage of that by putting as many players on the same team as possible in your lineup. This isn't really much of a factor in NBA, and I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Um, ownership is just how frequently the player's rostered in a contest. If one of your players has a huge game and they're very high owned, that doesn't do you a whole lot of good in a, a top heavy GVP tournament. Um, but if they're very low owned and they have a really good game, then that's going to give you a lot of upside and a really good chance to, to have a really top lineup. Um, variance is how a player's performance varies game to game. So two players may have the exact same projection, but their floor and ceiling may be a whole lot different. And I'll get into that more a little later. Um, so correlations for NBA, what do correlations look like in general? NBA, there's not a whole lot of strong correlations between players or strong negative correlations between players on opposite teams. It's really nuanced. In general, starters on the same team are positively correlated or players who tend to play in the same lineup are positively correlated. Uh, point guards are more correlated to other players than other positions because 
point guards get high assists and assists are one of the main ways in which players score together because an assist is basically uh, one player pass the ball to someone and they score points and that player gets an assist. So that's the positively correlated event that you, you have one player and another on the same team getting stats at the same time. There's also some negative correlations, like bench players tend to have a negative correlation to a starter they may play over. But it's really nuanced and kind of hard to understand. And this is why simulating is so useful for NBA correlations, because they're not always completely intuitive. Um, so what does that mean for stacking? So stacking, as far as putting uh, as many people on the same team in your lineup, is not really a great strategy. Um, the small for positive correlation between starters can often mean like playing two to four starters together can be optimal, but often like projections and variants are just as important. And there can be such strong value in terms of projection per salary where you're going to want to put a player in the lineup, even if he's the lone person on the team. Um, and your lineups are going to be much more based on who has the best value on the slate rather than, who are on the same team or, uh, you know, you're not gonna just going to stack two teams together, or three teams in a given lineup. It's mostly just going to be who are the best players on the slate and uh, who is the best value and how can we fit all those people to the lineup regardless of what team they're on. So I'm trying to wrap my head around this. And I, I think the, it seems nuanced, but I do think it's an important point, which is why I'm trying to highlight it. And it's that rather than saying, I am going to find two to four starters to stack. You're more saying, okay, there could be a case where because the matchup is so strong, because all these other factors are in the right case, that there are two to four starters from the same team that are the right play to have in your lineup. And correlations boost that, but that's not exclusively why you're playing it. You're playing it because of the playing the stack because of all these other variables that that are really boosting their projections almost independently. Um, is that fair to say? Like, how would you? Yeah, kind of I think, think you, you probably said that better than I did. Yeah. So the correlations <laughs> are really small. So really, the the projections and the variances of the individual players are really dominant there. It's really like, you know, it's it's such a small factor that it's often like a tiebreaker. Like the small correlation will often be like, okay, I can play, you know, Chris, I'm playing Chris Paul, and then one of the forwards on the Thunder. Or I could play this other forward on another team who is the same projection as the forward. In that case, the, the small positive correlation between Chris Paul and the starter, a fellow starter, uh, would, would make you want to pick the other starter. I Basically, also, if everything's yeah. the same, the correlation can kind of be a tiebreaker. But in general, you're not, it's not a huge factor in what the optimal mm -hmm. lineups are. I also wanted to add, I think a lot of people will see, you know, they'll look at some of the top tournaments and some of the top players and they'll see three or four people from the same team in a lineup and think, oh, this has to do with stacking. Well, it probably actually doesn't. A lot of NBA has to do with injury impact. If one or two players are out from a team, especially a key player, that can raise the value a lot of some of the players on the team. And what ends up happening is, there are three players on the team that are now great values. And that's why you'll see a lot of good players use two, three, or four players from the same team in the lineup. It actually doesn't have to do with correlation at all. So I just want to hammer that point in because I think a lot of people get a little confused looking at lineups and think, oh, why is this going on? And it's, it, it's for a different reason than you might think. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it, yeah, at the same time, you're, not all, you're also not really avoiding stacking either. In some situations, as Max is saying, you'll have teams where there's like so many injuries where there's only seven or eight active players and you're going to have a whole lot of value on that team and probably are going to have lineups where you're going to play three or four starter or three or four players from that team just because the value is so good, not because of the correlation at all. How, how does this apply when it comes to thinking about game stacking? Because this is something that a lot more people in the space are, are talking about now. Um, if, if you're watching other videos, if you're listening to podcasts, whatever, game stacking in all sports seems like it's kind of the, the trend. And so is that a thing that, that we should be thinking about in NBA or, or what is your take on that? Yeah, it's, so it's not entirely clear. 
it, possibly. So, so the idea behind game stacking at NBA is basically you hope to have a game that goes to multiple overtimes. And if the game goes to multiple overtimes, then starters on both teams are going to have like a shitload of fantasy points. So there is a positive correlation between players on opposite teams when the game goes to multiple overtimes. But that can happen like uh, that's a, a rare occurrence. I think I don't have the statistics in front of me, but probably, you know, less than 5% of NBA games go to overtime. Um, so it's really unclear. I mean, game stacking can be okay if like you have a very high over under game, um, but it's very probable that you can make better lineups with more upside by not game stacking if there is like a large amount of value across the slate. I'll just add as well, a lot, I will, you see a lot of people talking about game stacking and I feel like, though I think we all agree there's a little value, that value is almost negated by the fact that people create lineups like that. Like you end up being like everyone else, which is not great for tournaments. And so any value that's there might just straight up be negated by the fact that a lot of people like to do it. So yeah, and that's so a good point. On that point, we're kind of transitioning into ownership a bit. How are you applying it to NBA? Because this is where... I feel like it's not as intuitive as it may be in a sport that's super high variance like baseball, where like if there's just a super highly projected batting stack or whatever it may be, like fading is almost never going to be a bad choice. But in basketball, I know that's not always the case. So how are you thinking about when to kind of eat the chalk or when to fade it? Yeah, so that's well said. Like in baseball, if there's like a hitter that's going to be 50% owned, I almost always fade them just because it's it's there's such a high probability that they can still have a very bad game. That's not really the case in NBA. Sometimes there's like such incredible value because of team injuries uh, that you, even though the person's going to be high owned, that you still want to play them just because the value is too overwhelming. And Sometimes it does make sense to fade, but I think that's why it's important to have a lineup builder that does all those calculations for you based on the player projections and the ownership like Saberson does, because it's kind of hard to weigh the factors of, okay, should I fade this guy? How good is two value? Or how good is two good value? Saberson <laughs> really does that math for you. Um, but in general, as a rule of thumb, uh, there's often times where people have two strong projections per their salary uh, to make them worth fading. So in general, there's some rules of thumb where it does make sense to fade. If someone could get into foul trouble, like if there's a very high on center, often centers can get into foul trouble. If they get into foul trouble, they won't play much. They won't get many fantasy points. Um, are they coming up off the bench or is it not certain they're going to start? Uh, sometimes we don't know the starters ahead of time and a player we think is going to start comes off the bench and that could be a really good opportunity to, to fade the chalk because often if someone's not starting, they may not get enough fantasy points to be worth playing. So it's kind of like the more uncertainty there is around a player's minutes, the, the more likely you should be to fade them if it seems as though they're going to be highly owned. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of on that note as well, when we're talking about variance, how does that impact how you're diversifying across all of your lineups? Yeah, so there's really not high variance in NBA. It's, it's really one of the most predictable sports. So sometimes that means that playing 100% of one player is the correct strategy, even though it seems like, God, if this player does badly, I'm going to do horribly. That just isn't something that, that's something that sometimes will not happen that often if you have a player who's truly, truly, like, extremely good value. Um, so it's not necessarily high variance to go 100% one player if they're really good value. And oftentimes that can be the correct strategy if they're really, really good. And I guess just actually taking a step back a little bit, we've been, talked a lot about value, but for some people watching this, they, they may not know exactly what you mean. They may have an intuitive sense of it, but like how do you define value? And then like, what are you really looking for when it comes to uh, a player whose value is almost unavoidable? Yeah, so when I'm talking about value, I'm talking about projection relative to salary. So someone with like a minimum salary who's very high projected is like really good value. Um, if someone has a high salary, you're often uh, 
going for less value relative their their salary as like a good value. Like if someone's like projected for six to seven times their salary uh, and they're a very high salary player, that's extremely good. But often for like min salary guys, you'll have situations where they're projected to score 10 to 12 times their salary. And that can be a person who's, you just want to put 100% of your lineups or you're just going to lose basically. And talking about some of the other unique considerations for basketball, um, I, I know that a lot of what you've gone back to is is the importance of, of certainty around minutes and, and just kind of mm-hmm. how that's what a lot of this comes down to. Can you just expand a little bit uh, about what it is um, that you're looking for when paying attention to the minutes, if there's any ways that people can kind of get trapped by just looking at minutes? Like, how are, are you approaching the just idea of, of minutes? Yeah, so so often like the lowest upside people relative to their projection are going to be the guys with the highest minutes. Now that doesn't mean you're not going to play someone who is high minutes. Often like the absolute best players like James Harden, Giannis Antetokounmpo, LeBron, they're all going to have very high minutes projections. Um, but there's often guys where you get trapped where you or you, there's a tra- easy trap where you know you have this low fantasy point per minute player who's supposed to get like 34 minutes. Um, and that guy's really not going to be high upside minute. More minutes means more certainty. And there's also kind of a, ca- a natural cap on how many minutes a player can get uh, in a, like 48 is the absolute most, but you almost never see that really. The cap is like around 40 minutes. Almost n- no one is going to get more than 40 minutes in the game. So if you're projected for really high minutes, there's not like a lot of upside there necessarily. So in general, you kind of want to look for guys who don't necessarily are high projected, but don't necessarily have a lot of minutes for that projection. They're a guy who gets a lot of fantasy points per minute. And if they happen to have a game where they get a lot of minutes, then they're going to get a lot of fantasy points. Whereas someone who doesn't have a lot of fantasy points per minute, if they get a lot of minutes, they're not necessarily going to have a good fantasy game. Uh, Can you, do you mind walking through like, in, the example doesn't have to be like from an exact date and time and this and that, but like, can you just kind of walk through like any examples that come to mind of a player who, who might have higher upside with, without um, having being projected for a ton of minutes. Like they, they might have that, that high yeah, so fantasy points per minute. Danny, right. I could take this one. Cause I, okay, I'm looking at the slate right now. Cause it's someone like Royce O'Neal, he's going to start for Utah. I'm pretty sure. And he's a perfect example of a uh, high minute, low fantasy point per minute guy. He gets, we have him projected about 22 and a half DK points. And he's a starter. He's projected for a lot of minutes, over 30 minutes. He's a guy who is going to be someone where he's probably not going to play more minutes than we project him. He, he's a starter. He gets a lot of minutes. But he does have downside of getting to foul trouble, getting badged, something like that. And there's just not much upside there. Like take on the flip side, maybe someone coming off the Lakers bench, like Cal Kuzma, 20, we haven't projected as 24 minutes. He's projected about the same as Royce and Neal, but you know, the Lakers could, you know, have the bench play really well. They could insert him in into the fourth quarter. He's a high production player. He has that minutes upside. He's someone who, I would be a lot more excited to target than Royce O'Neal because Kuzma could get 30 minutes, the same amount as Royce O'Neal. And if he gets 30 minutes, he's going to do a hell of a lot better than Royce O'Neal. Yeah. And often with, with players with lower minute projections, often if they play well, they'll often get more uh-huh. minutes too. So that kind of adds to the upside there. So it's really like, yeah, Max, that was a great example. I think in general, like shooting guards and small forwards tend to be low fantasy points per minute players. So you can get like, a shooting guard or small forward who gets moved into the starting lineup because of injury. And, you know, he's in a lineup with maybe James Harden or Russell Westbrook or LeBron, where he's just not going to get that many fantasy points, but he's going to get a lot of minutes. And that can be really like, Oh, this guy's certainly good because he's going to get a lot of minutes and it feels safe, but you really don't want safety. You want upside. You want potential. Um, Yeah. And, let's talk a bit more about injuries. I mean, this is something that drives a ton of what happens in daily fantasy basketball. 
can can you just talk a little bit about the role that injuries play in in all this in in the process for building lineups? Yeah, injuries are really, really, really important in NBA. I would say more so than any other sport. Like with MLB, if you have like a bad hitter move into the starting lineup, they're not necessarily going to have a good game. Uh, with NBA, if you have someone playing minutes, like minutes and fantasy points are very correlated. So if someone goes from getting 10 minutes a game to 30 minutes a game, their fantasy points are going to go way up. So in general, injuries cause people to get more minutes uh, or players' roles to change and for their minutes to increase or decrease. And that could be a tremendous uh, a place to find value. And oftentimes you'll have injuries at the last second where you'll have to, I mean, in general, when, when teams are more injured, the other players on the team, their projected tends to go up because they have to play the other players who are healthy more minutes than they would normally do if the team was fully uh, healthy. So injuries are very, very important because minutes uh, really leads to fantasy points more than any other sport. If you're on the court in basketball, you're going to get stats and you're going to get fantasy points. It's easy for just a rebound to fall to you. It's easy for one of your passes to lead to a three-pointer that gets made for an assist. Sometimes you get left under the basket for an easy layup. Sometimes you get an offensive rebound. There's just basically you will get stats if you're on the floor in an NBA, and that's not really the case with any other sport. And that's why injuries really matter for NBA. One of the other things I, I know you've, you've mentioned before is just see – the risk of overestimating the probability that a player may start because of an injury. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So injuries, it, it, I think it takes a lot of experience to, to interpret them correctly. Often it can seem like, Oh, the starting center is injured. So the backup center is going to play. That's not necessarily true. A lot of times coaches will try weird rotations. They'll play a power forward at center. They'll play a small forward at center they'll try weird lineup combinations. So definitely don't, it's, it's definitely not always as straightforward as, oh, the starter's injured, I'm just going to play the backup. Often minutes are distributed in, in more nuanced ways than, than that. So obviously this is a very different season now that, that things have resumed. They're playing in a bubble in Orlando. And there's just a lot of unique considerations to keep in mind to this. And everything that Max and Dania have talked about applies kind of across the board in basketball. But in this unique season of 2020, um, there are some other considerations to keep in mind. So I'm just going to kind of go through these. But Danny, Max, jump in if there's anything that you guys want to add or if there's anything else you think that people should really keep in mind to it. And for me, a lot of this comes down to – the, the fact that with the schedule that the NBA has put out so far, there are almost no overlapping start times. Um, and that means that the games just by the nature are spread throughout the day. And so, so far, I mean, this is still early, but what we've seen is that the contests have been all day slates for that main slate. And this is going to mean that the contests will lock at an, the afternoon on Eastern time, but the contest will go all the way until the middle of the night. And so that adds a unique kink to things where you might not have as much information as you otherwise would on a traditional kind of NBA season. Um, and so with that in mind, um, if it is one of those all day slates, what we would always recommend doing, and this applies honestly to, to any slate, you want to put the latest starting player in your lineup in the flex because that will give you the most flexibility if, if they get ruled out or if someone gets ruled out, you can move things around a lot easier because you know that player can always be swapped out for someone else if you need to make multiple changes to your lineup. This is something that we automatically do for you in Sabreism as we build your lineups. But again, just if you're building by hand using another tool, just make sure that you're setting things up so that the latest, the player with the latest starting game in your lineup is in the flex. Um, the other kind of just obvious one is just you need to pay attention to the news. You have to see who is going to be in those confirmed lineups, who's ruled out, so you get an idea of, okay, like, do I need to swap anyone out? Um, this gets tough because the NBA 
is already known for just being really bad with starting lineups. Um, they were supposed to have them out officially, I think, as 30 minutes before tip-off. And while they might be a little bit better than they had been in previous seasons, it's still not good, and there's still plenty of late scratches. Um, and with just all the different possibilities for why someone could be ruled out in the current season, um, there's a lot of risk that you have there. And so all of this honestly depends on how much time you have available. If you can't stay on top of the news and you still want to play, I would just say, okay, consider fading that first game. Look at the block of games that are all starting roughly close to each other in the afternoon and put a lineup in that uses only confirmed lineups. Uh, this will definitely sacrifice some edge but because you're not looking at as large of a player pool as there is. But that is much better than getting a zero um, by putting someone in that, that ends up getting scratched or, or whatever else happens. Um, for the all-day slate in general, um, it, if you do have time to watch everything, it still can be worth fading that first game just because it's usually like eight hours before the last game. And so there is almost no chance that all the lineups will be out by that time. So by fading that first game, you can see – all right, I can get some of these afternoon lineups in and then maybe some of the later ones have come in and you just get a much better idea of what's going on. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on is know how the sites work when it comes to late swap. FanDuel this season offers it. Um, they hadn't in the past, and that's a good thing with, with these weird schedules. But they have their own quirks for how they handle swapping out players. On DraftKings, you have very little control over it. Um, you can only swap out a player for someone who has a lower salary than that player, or I guess lower or equal. Whereas on FanDuel, you have the option of trying to force in a player with a higher salary. And the reason that matters is because if all of your lineups have $50,000 or, or the exact salary amount spent, then this isn't a big deal. But oftentimes, and if you don't do this, you probably should have some, um, buffer in those lineups just to promote uniqueness and just because that's how things are going to work out. And if you are forced to rely just on what DraftKings has, you're going to be oftentimes leaving a lot of money on the table. So you just want to go into these slates knowing what to expect. Um, we, we think that this is going to be a profitable season if you follow this advice and if you are aware of what's going on and quick to adapt, but you just want to be sure regardless that, that you're aware of these, these other factors. Do you guys have any other points you want to add? Oh, absolutely. So I would say I would say what's unique about this NBA season is there's actually some strategy in how you manage this sort of all-day slate, right? Is you know, Andy mentioned fading the earliest game. If you fade the earliest game, you have more leverage in terms of if news comes out, you can make perfect lineups with that late news. And basically the later games sort of have more of an advantage because you have more information. And so you can get creative with boosting projections of players in the later games. You, there's, a, there's basically a strategy around it and that's going to give you some edge. So we're always looking for places where you can add value and get more of an edge. And one of those things in this basketball season is going to be how do you deal with the fact that these games are spread out over the entire day. This is just not a factor in baseball or football or hockey really at all. I mean, there is a spread, but it, it just doesn't really matter. In NBA, it really matters. So it's something to really think about. Yeah, I was just, I just wanted to add that uh, I think this season is kind of high opportunity because there's going to be a lot of weird things that happen. So following the news is important. I think one thing to pay attention to too is minute limits that often happens in nba where a player has a minute limit and that can really limit their upside and make them not worth playing so really paying attention to what the coaches are saying or just news in general if people have minute limits because they had coronavirus or an injury i mean it's been a while since these people played games uh there's also a regular season that's not really that important so it's possible that you're going to see coaches really manage their players minutes a lot so there's going to be a lot of nuance there to really uh, have to pay attention to. Let's talk a bit about what goes into putting all of this together. Uh, we, we covered a lot there and it can be hard to kind of draw the lines between, okay, I, I get the principles. I get, I get the fundamentals that, that you guys have covered, but 
when it comes time to, to build my lineups, there's just so many questions, so many things I'm trying to figure out. And so Max, if you want to jump in and just kind of walk through at least the first part of building lineups, which really comes down to, to research, can you share um, what you do on this? And I know for you, stats are, are one of the, the fundamental kind of foundational things that you focus on. So maybe that'd be a good place to start. Yeah. So just to start, I'll say, you know, in these videos, I talk a lot about adding value to SaberSim. And I think the best way for you to add value in NBA is working on those projections because there's a lot of free resources out there and project getting good projections is going to be the most important thing for you to win at DFS NBA. And so a couple um, places that are a big part of my process is actually from the NBA itself. It's stats.nba. Um, the NBA has cameras that are actually on the core and give, they give us a lot of really, really great stats that show sort of how players are actually used on the court. And this is really, really important, especially if there's injuries, right? And so let's say, um, for example, and, and there's going to be a lot of injuries, right? But let's say someone like LeBron James or someone like that is out for a game, right? So we can look at stats at NBA and look at some of the advanced stats um, to see how players are used. If you look at LeBron, you can see this is a stat we really like is unassisted field goals. So LeBron has high unassisted field goals. This means that he handles the ball a lot. He's essentially the point guard. So if LeBron James is out and we know Rashawn Rondo has a broken hand, we have to look at, okay, who is going to be sort of taking control of this offense? What is going to happen, right? So we can see that Quinn Cook is someone, I don't actually know if he's on the team right now, but really he had unassisted, he is, he might. So let's say Quinn Cook starts, he's a high emphasis field field guy. That makes sense. He's the point guard. So he's probably going to be handling the ball a lot. And that's going to mean a boost in stats. Playing without LeBron is going to help people who actually create a shot on their own. Um, you can see guys like Kyle Kuzma, 30%. That's actually pretty good for power forward, small forward. And you look at these stats, um, these different stats to see, okay, who do I think is going to handle the ball more? You can lo also look at some advanced stats. I think they have secondary assists. Um, you can look at players on a game to game basis. You can look at their total shot percentage. You can look at their usage percentage. You could look at their defensive rating. There's a lot of really good stuff on here. And so I think that's a, a pretty big part of my process as well as there's a free website called popcorn machine, which really shows you sort of how the rotations, um, are playing out for a particular team. So you can look at, okay, you know, who's going in for who, um, this can help you predict starters. For example, let's say Jamal Murray is out. If you look at who has been going in for Jamal Murray in this back in March, those might have changed. But you can see Monty Morris is the first sub for Jamal Murray, who's the point guard. So if Jamal Murray's out and we don't have enough starters, I will look at Popcorn Machine and say, okay, who seems to consistently be going in with Jamal Murray? Uh, who seems to play with the starters sometimes as well? And then I'll use that to help confirm who might start. So I might be pretty confident that Monty Morris is going to start for Jamal Murray, even if it's not announced. You also want to look at foul trouble recently to see, okay, this person has not been playing a lot of minutes. Is that because they've been getting fouls or is it because of something else? And it looks like just by looking at this, this is not something that's in this game, but I think reading how these lineups are going in and out in a popcorn machine is a really, really huge part of my process. And one of the things that, that I want to just, just touch on here is that this is, this is not necessarily a requirement. This is digging into the advanced stats like this is not what everyone needs to do, has to do, or, or, or does even the high stakes guys, everyone has to find their way of adding value to the process. And Max likes to dig into those advanced stats, really likes to look at all those situations. And honestly, it, it's not super complicated. And I think what he just gave is a pretty good primer to get you up to speed on, on how you can do that relatively easily. But even at a more basic level, there are some, some ways you can use the data we already have for you inside of uh, inside of SaberSim. And Max, if you just want to talk a little bit about kind of looking at the detailed player projections and, and what to look for when it comes to minutes, when it comes to how to react to the news, because that ultimately to me is kind of the, the baseline that if you are serious about 
playing daily fantasy basketball, you have to be able to react to the news. Otherwise, you're going to have a hard time. And so, Max, if you can just kind of talk about how people can can do that part of things um, from within Saverson, that would be great. Yeah, so I think the best way actually to just save you time and get a good sense of who to focus on is actually just to do a build before we even look at anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use the default build settings and build some lineups, right? And this is going to tell us, okay, who are the people that we're getting a lot and who are the people we want to focus on? Because if you're just looking at every player's stats and then you're like, oh, you know, uh, JaVale McGee, I'm going to adjust him one point. And, you know, I did all this research. And then you notice even if you adjust him one point, you don't get him at all. That's going to be a, a real pointless amount of it. I mean, you're doing good work and theoretically good job, but it's, it's going to be a real pointless amount of work, right? So we're going to do a sample bill and, and just look at some people who are standing out. I would see, say that one person that immediately stands out to me is Joe Kim Noah, right? Is I didn't even know he was on the Clippers. So I think he was a recent sign. And I don't know if he starts. I don't know if he's coming off the bench. This is like a real thing. Like you're, this is why it's good to do this build because I honestly just don't know what's going on with them. And so if I see something like this, I think what I'm first going to do is just start looking for news about Joachim Noah. Is he starting? Is there a minutes limit? How old is he? Like, what is the depth of the team? You're going to have to look at a lot of stuff, right? And so one thing we can do is just actually look at the Clippers team and, and who's being projected and, and sort of just look at the thing. So we see Avika Zubak is out. He's usually the starter for the Clippers. Patrick Beverly is out. I think that's due to coronavirus. I think Montrez Harrell also might be out due to coronavirus. So they're actually pretty thin at center. If I'm looking at this right now, I'm only seeing eight people. This might be wrong. There might end up being more than that. Um, so we can say, okay, this team is really thin, right? But now we're saying, okay, so Joe Kim Noah's 20 minutes makes sense. For an eight-man rotation, if he is starting, that actually does probably make sense, right? So um, this is something where I'm going to do more research, look, see if there's a minutes gap, see who might play center, right? Danny was talking earlier about, you know, what players – might weirdly play center due to injury. We could see maybe Marcus Morris, maybe Jermichael Green, almost certainly Jermichael Green, actually. So if you look at how those minutes play out, you can see, okay, maybe, you know, Jermichael Green, 22 minutes. Maybe that's too low. Um, maybe Marcus Morris, 29 minutes. Maybe he's going to have to play a lot more because of the short rotation. Who have they signed? You know, there's a, there's a lot of things to just look at. And I, I, th I think that's really important. I think that's why doing a, a build at the start is really really good so you know if i was actually doing this i'm actually you know just looking at the first glance i'm not sure what i do i might lower him but he actually is a really good value and again this this feeds on the other point we were making before some players in basketball are just really good value and you can't fade them and at min salary on an eight-man rotation usually you're not going to be able to fade someone like Joe Kim Noah, who does probably have a high fantasy point per minute output. So um, that's one bit of research I might do. I'm going to look at, you know, probably not look at LeBron, given that I'm going to be pretty confident in his projection. I, I really want to look at these low salary guys. Maybe Josh Hart, right? Here's another guy who stands out. It's another low salary guy. Um, we can look at New Orleans as well, see what their rotation looks like. You know, Zion Williamson might be out at the start of the restart. So we want to look at their rotation. Um, they seem to have more healthy players in general. Um, I don't know if Josh Hart is going to start. I don't know if he's going to come off the bench. We only have him at 24 minutes, so he might be coming off the bench. And maybe I'll like a popcorn machine, look at how New Orleans rotation has um, – before before the NBA stopped, how their rotation was sort of working out and just take a look or maybe look at the last time Zion Williamson was out and just do some research there and, and, and maybe even look at game logs and see what is his minutes upside and things like that. Yeah, and I mean, this is, this is something where it's important to keep in mind um, the, the different abilities that we all have to spend time on this. Max and Danny are both professionals. So when they start researching, 
it's truly like they are going to look at practically every player, not necessarily in the same amount of depth, but like they're going to analyze every single game. They're going to try to look at every single player. They're going to look for every single angle that they can find. Um, but I don't have time to do that. I'm guessing you probably don't have the time to do that either. And so that's where this, what we call within Savers, we call it a test build. That's where this really comes into play because it helps you narrow down, okay, I don't have time to look at absolutely every single player. So what if I can just do this test build and then see who we're naturally high or low on? Then I can say, do any of these jump out at me? Do any of these seem like, based on, on what I've known, what I've been doing just from following the news casually, does this seem weird to me? And then with your amount of time that you have available to, to do your research, you can focus in on those things that, that jump out at you. And Max, if you want to go back to the home screen quickly, we had talked a lot about just how staying on top of the news is crucial as well. And we do our absolute best to adjust projections as fast as we can whenever there's late breaking news. But there is simply some news that that comes out so close to lock that we can't react as quickly as we would like. Um, or it's just honestly not always clear what how things are going to shake out. And so what we recommend doing is as you're staying on top of the news is looking at the minutes column over here to see how many minutes we're projecting for each player. And that can show you, okay, have they adjusted for this news? Have they then adjusted for it in a way that I think they should? And that will also guide you in the right direction of making some adjustments and figuring out what are these areas where I can add value to the process with my research, even if I don't have a ton of time. And this is, in my opinion, the the absolute fastest way to get up and running and, and add some value to your builds. Because again, we all only have a certain amount of time that we can spend on this. And by doing this test build first, by staying on top of the news and by just seeing who is jumping out as the handful of players I need to focus on, you're able to get a ton of research in relatively speaking, get leverage on that research and make an impact on this. And so what Max we'll do from here is just kind of walk through the process of, okay, we've already talked about the research, but now what does the actual build process look like? What do I do to really put that into my lineups and get some high upside lineups out of this? Right. So um, essentially what the build process is a three step process, right? So step one is going to be adjusting the projections. So we've identified some situations of players that we want to focus on and you know, a couple of things that stand out to me is one, just from the Clippers situation, I think I'm probably going to boost you Michael Green a little bit because I think he's probably could play some crunch time center. They're really thin. I like just in general targeting players from really thin teams because they're just going to have to get minutes and there's some minutes upside there. There, I think um, maybe, you know, and again, I haven't done that much research yet, but someone like Alex Caruso, um, is going to play some point guard. He's a player that gets a lot of stats. He could get some good minutes. He's someone I might boost to. And also we have these ownership projections, right? And I think this is something that goes pretty overlooked. People just say ownership projections, whatever, like, great, where I'm going to use them, fade, blah, blah, blah. They have some whatever. But we actually allow you to adjust them. And I think that's another way you can really add value because – you see some of these guys on New Orleans, you know, Zion Williamson is out. Someone like Brandon Ingram, I might just look at the front page of some of these tout sites, see Brandon Ingram's picture and be like, you know what? It really seems like people are going to use him. You know, you can increase his ownership percentage and that can help with when you're using the ownership fade, um, when you're actually choosing your build settings, actually help add value to your lineups, right? So you're going to adjust some of these projections. Maybe Anthony Davis looks a little low to me. Whatever, let's raise him too. And so then we go into this step two of the build process, right? Which is choose your build settings. And we have given this a lot of thought and have chosen some great default settings to you that are actually tailored to the slate, right? So this is a two-game slate that's going to have certain default settings. Six-game slates are going to have certain default settings. We have cash settings. We have GPPs that are small, that are big. And this is going to change what is sort of going on under the hood with the build settings. But um, I'm going to just show you what sort of goes into it. So the default settings for a 20 max GPP with a lot of entrance, which is going to probably happen during this NBA season quite a bit, 
um, has three key components, right? What we've talked about before, correlation, ownership, and smart diversity, which um, actually is upside in a sense. So these settings have um, a lot of thought in, put into them. And they're not just something random. Like you might look at this and go, huh, this is interesting. Why is correlation zero? There must be an error. It's actually not an error. I would say the first thing, correlation, right? We've talked about how correlation is not that important part of NBA. As you can see, correlations between players are very small, right? So um, considering them is not going to be a huge factor in the process. And they also are sort of already considered when talking about smart diversity, which I'll get into a bit. Ownership fade. This is something where we're just going to consider what are the ownership of the player and that's it's going to build your lineups considering that factor and, and giving a score to the lineups based on the ownership of the player that are in it, that are in the lineup. And then smart diversity, which I think is our coolest and most interesting feature. And it has to do with how SaberSim actually works, right? We are a simulator. So we simulate every NBA game thousands of times, and that gives us great data, right? It gives us a range of outcomes for players. It gives correlations for players. And what that ends up doing is it allows us to diversify your lineups with taking into consideration upside. Because instead of just randomly selecting different lineups with different average projections and using min unique players or doing some sort of jerry rig thing to diversify your lineups, how we actually diversify your, your lineups is we just take some amount of simulations. And if you set smart diversity very high, it's just going to be a few simulations. And we actually take the average projection from just those two or three simulations that we are choosing for you. And what ends up happening is you are going to get lineups that have high upside because it's going to maximize for the simulations while diversifying your lineups in a way that you know, you're actually going to get a diversity of players, but with maximizing for the upside of those lineups, right? And you know, with correlation, correlation is kind of going to be built into this because how correlation works in practice, it means players are scoring together or they're negatively correlated to each other. So if we're just taking simulation data, we're actually going to be considering that correlation already because we're just taking what actually might happen given our simulations. If, if there's anything you guys want to add as well. Yeah, um, the, the only thing I would it. add is just that, that, yeah, I mean, I think this is something where you can really fine tune it if you want to have more control over it. But even in that case, this, I mean, Max, how much time do you spend on this second step? Um, five seconds. I, yeah. I might fine tune it, I might not. I mean, you did, these are the settings I would absolutely use for a two game slate. Yeah, and, and so that's kind of the, the big thing here, where it's, it's, we want to show you what's happening under the hood. But one of the main reasons that we built SaberSim is because we felt there was just so much busy work in DFS that a computer could do better than we could on our own. And so while it's important to understand kind of how the machine works, we have built this in a way where you tell us the contest you're playing, the entry limit, the number of entrants, all that, and we'll choose what we feel are the, the best slider settings for you so that if you don't feel as though you need to have extra control above that, you can leave this alone, build the lineup pool and move on and, and not be leaving anything on the table. But again, if you do feel like you really understand these concepts and do want to make some slight adjustments, you can do that under the advanced settings. And if you want to add a stack and roll, which for MBA, I would strongly advise against, that is an option as well. Yeah, we've got things set. We, we understand what's going on behind the scenes with this. What happens next? Yeah, so we're going to just build the lineup pool. And again, so one, I think, really cool factor about SaberSim is when you request 20 lineups, we're actually going to build you a lot more than that. I think eventually it's going to build a 1,000. And that's going to give you a lot of control in the post-build process in terms of just what, what we call the quality control process. So this has to do with fine tuning your lineups. This is not, let's change a bunch of things. If you see something that you don't like, where you're saying, uh, you know, I have, jo I, we were talking about Joe Kim Noah before. They're like, oh man, I actually now think he's too high projected. I see that is a minutes limit. Suddenly this news comes out. That's something where you're gonna wanna go back to the home screen 
and adjust his projection and rebuild. So once you've tuned all of that, or maybe his ownership percentage, you know, something that I, I miss, right, is that he actually is going to be owned more than 1%. We're, 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 we don't have some secret here, right? So this is something that's not updated. So you might want to raise his ownership percentage or something. But once we've really gotten our projections and ownership projections to where we want them, now we're just talking about quality control. This is talking about getting a little more diversity if you want, maybe capping someone's exposure a little bit, just doing some things that are just gonna fine tune your lineups, right? And you know, we, we have stuff with team stacking and stack types, which I think is a lot more helpful for NFL and MLB than it is for NBA. Mostly you're just gonna focus on players, right? And so you might say, okay, Marcus Morris, he's someone that maybe I wanna get a little more. Okay, well then I'm going to just raise his min uh, exposure to 20% or maybe 25%. Um, maybe you're like, you know, I like Joe Kim Noah, but uh, maybe not 100%. Okay, we can cap his exposure at 80%. And Saberson is going to automatically trade in the most high value lineups and trade out the most low value lineups that have Joe Kim Noah to balance this out. And really, there's not that much more to this process, right? It's this is it, right? You, if you have any drastic things that you want to do, I would go back to the projections. You can screw with team stacks and stack types, but I think with specifically with NBA, this is not that important. And I think with MLB, with, which is a high correlated sport, then looking at stacks and stack types is going to be a, a huge thing that you can do. But with NBA, we're just talking really about players. And you know, this is something that I'm going to do. I'm going to just fine tune my exposures a little bit, make sure that I have balanced lineups. And then I'm just going to download and put them into DraftKings or FanDuel. And that's about it. Yeah. And, and to just emphasize the, the kind of reasoning behind the setup we have, we, we found that people who might be more familiar with traditional optimizers kind of have this obsession with very specific exposure percents and trying to get everything perfect and they come into it with I want X percent of this player, Y percent of so on, and Z percent of someone else. And we just frankly feel like that's backwards. We, we think it all comes down to the data. It all comes down to projections. And that's why we say rather than trying to force a specific exposure in, see what if, if, if it's someone like uh, Rudy Gobert, if that's too much of him, lower his projection and see if that gets you a little bit less of him. See how far you have to lower his projection to get the percentage that you're looking for. Because if you have to cut someone's projection in half to get them as little as you want them, maybe your, your intuitions might be leading you a little bit of a stray. Right. And, and that's kind of the, the value of this process is that we're not perfect. There are going to be times where you do have to tweak what we, what we do. And honestly, in most slates, you should sit, make some adjustments, but we can kind of act as almost like a little bit of, of a, a conscience on your shoulder just saying, Hey, like, do you really need that much of this player? Or do you really want that little of him? Like maybe you should rethink that because by just focusing on the exposures, you lose that kind of sanity check that, that bringing things back to the projections have. And by starting out with that test build that we talked about, by seeing who we're naturally high or low on, you're very able to, you're able to very easily see who are those players that you need to pay attention to. Go back over, start from step one, adjust the projections, choose your build settings, and then get those exposures fine-tuned. But it's a bit of a different process, but I hope that once you've, kind of, you've seen us go through that, after we've explained this as well, I hope this makes it a bit uh, more understandable and you can see just how powerful this is and how honestly much easier it is to get those high upside lineups without spending hours and hours trying to kind of program a tool to do exactly what you want it to do. So in summary, we, we covered a lot here, um, but there are really ultimately six keys that I want you to take away from this. And the first and most important is just pay attention to the news. Basketball is a game of late breaking news and the news has very significant impact. So you just have to pay attention to that. If you're not able to focus on confirmed lineups, but know that you're going to be sacrificing some edge when it comes to stacking. Sometimes it happens, but almost never for kind of stacking sake alone. So don't force that. 
The third point is find the value. This is really what's going to tell you if you should eat the chalk or fade it is the value is seeing, okay, is this someone who is going to, who was min salary, low salary, but now is starting is going to get a lot of usage. Is this someone that I just have to play or are there another, is there another player with better value at a similar projection that I can swap in here for them? How do I find the right person to put in there? The fourth one is sometimes you have to be okay with 100% exposure. And I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, like I think Max and Danny probably are okay with 100% exposure in certain cases, but if that's too high for you, then maybe 90%, maybe 80%, but you just really don't want to force too much diversity into your lineups because there are times where the value is so high, you just have to play someone a lot. The fifth key is, is focusing on projections. And this comes down to that, obviously ownership, obviously correlations, obviously these other factors matter, but NBA is going to be the sport, honestly, where projections really matter above all else. So you want to make your adjustments. You want to really get those dialed in because that is what's going to be driving most of the value that, that you can add to the process here. And the last one is just use the right tools. There are a ton of tools out there for you. There's a ton of sites to look at. There's a ton of places to get good research, whatever it may be. Danny and Max have shared a few of those with you. Um, the other obvious tool that we want to talk about is Sabersim, but it's finding the tools that fit what, what you are trying to do and how much time you have available. And honestly, without the right tools, this is going to make DFS just frankly, just too complicated to really consistently find the time to actually play. NBA is going to take a bit more time to stay on top of things than other sports may. But because of that, I think it's even more important to find the tools that let you leverage your time on the highest value things so you're not wasting hours a day just getting dozens of settings exactly right so that everything works the way you want it to. You want to leverage the tools that are out there and with Sabersim, luckily, you can try us completely for free for three days and see if we're right for you. Not only will you get access to our NBA tools, but you'll get access to all of the sports that we have up, which are we've got baseball, football, practically everything that the major sites offer, we've got there. If you want to see how this works for you, how you're able to use this to quickly build high upside lineups, just head to sabersim.com and we've got a free trial that you can get started in just seconds. But honestly, I will end this and let you get started and start playing around with things yourself. I really appreciate the time and thank you guys so much. Danny, Max, thank you for joining me. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, yeah. Eddie.